The cranial nerve exam consists of a series of tests and observations designed to assess the function of the 12 cranial nerves. These include the olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal nerves. We will begin by testing the olfactory nerve. Note that physicians usually do not assess the olfactory nerve unless they suspect an altered sense of smell based on patient history. Hi, Paulina. Hi. Hi, I'm Dr. Henry Bargava. I'm going to be examining your cranial nerves today, which are the nerves that affect the function and the sensation in your face. Is that okay if we go ahead with that? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to start by asking you about your sense of smell. Uh, have you noticed any changes in your smell or your taste at all recently? No. Okay. Well, I'd like to go ahead and just test that if that's okay. So could you um, block your right nostril for me? Good. Scratch cards can be used to test the sense of smell. However, familiar scented objects such as citrus fruit or coffee may also be used. Can you tell me what this odor most smells like? Onion. Okay. And Avoid using noxious smells such as ammonia as this may irritate the nasal mucosa and stimulate the trigeminal nerve. Okay, let's block the other nostril now. Repeat this test on the other side to test the contralateral cranial nerve. Smells like. Pink dinner. Okay, great. So you're identifying those smells correctly, so I think your olfactory nerve is working well. Next we will assess the optic nerve. Optic nerve testing consists of the pupillary light reflex, swinging light tests, fundoscopy, visual fields, and visual acuity. I'm just going to now look at your visual system. I'm going to start with uh, uh, looking at your pupils and kind of medium dim light here. First, inspect and compare both pupils. Pupil shape, position, and diameter should be equal on both sides. They should be round in shape. Pupillary constriction is best examined in dim background light. So we're just going to look at the um, pupillary light reflex now. So I'm going to shine this in your eye. The optic nerve carries sensory information back to the brainstem and the oculomotor nerve carries motor information to pupillae constrictor muscles in both eyes. Contraction of these muscles constricts the pupils. I'm going to move on now to the swinging light test. So again, just keep looking behind me. This test allows us to check the relative strength of sensory signals being sent through each optic nerve. In a normal patient, the degree of pupillary constriction in both eyes is the same when the light is swung from one eye to the other eye. If one optic nerve has been damaged, the sensory signal traveling through that nerve will be weak. When light is shone into the eye on the damaged side, constriction of both pupils will be impaired, and both pupils will appear larger than they should. This weak constriction is only noticeable if you compare it to the robust pupil constriction in response to light being shone in the eye on the undamaged side. Keep your attention on only one pupil at a time, making sure that it constricts to the same size when the light is switched to the other eye. And then there's no afferent uh, pupillary defect. They constrict the first time every time, so that's normal. So we're going to move on to fundoscopy where I'm going to look at the back of your eyes, okay? Um, so just look off into the distance at the mark on the wall there, if you don't mind. Using your right eye to examine the patient's right eye, first point the ophthalmoscope's light at the patient's eye and observe the red reflex. Slowly approach the patient's head from the side until you are quite close and looking through the pupil. I'm going to look inside the other eye now. Keep looking at the back of the wall. You can use your free hand to hold the patient's eye open or to steady yourself on their forehead or shoulder. Once you see the back of the eye, adjust the lens selector to bring the fundus into focus. Only a small portion of the retina will be visible through the ophthalmoscope. First, find a blood vessel and follow it medially until you come to the optic disc. Inspect each disc carefully for bulging, blurred margins, pallor, and enlargement. Inspect the blood vessels and see if you can visualize the macula. 
So we're going to check your visual fields now. I'm going to start with the central visual field. So I'd like you to take your hand and cover your eye like this. And when you look at my face, is any part of it blurry? No. And you can see the whole face there? Yes. Good. And can you cover your other eye like that? Excellent. And again, you can see the whole face mm -hmm. and none of it looks blurry to you right now? No. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to move on to look at your peripheral visual fields um, using the counting fingers method. So I'd like you to cover your eye here and make sure you're still just looking at the bridge of my nose. I'm going to show you one or two fingers. Tell me how many you see. Okay. One. Two. Position yourself at arm's length away from the patient at eye level. Place your hands midway between yourself and the patient. Two, Close one eye one. so that your open eye is on the same side as the patient's. Make eye contact. One. Now that your and your patient's visual fields are aligned, assess the patient's peripheral vision by one. placing your fingers in your own peripheral vision. So normal visual fields centrally and peripherally, that's all good. Okay, we're going to move on to test your visual acuity now. and We're going to use the handheld chart here. Visual acuity can be assessed using a wall-mounted Snellen chart, which is viewed from 6 meters away, or a handheld card, typically viewed from closer according to the instructions on the card. Can you tell me what the smallest row of numbers that you can read is? 4, 2, 8, 7, 3, 9. Great, that's that one here, mm -hmm. and that's 20 over 20. Can you hold this in your other hand now and cover this eye? Great. To score visual acuity, record the number next to the smallest line that can be read by the patient. Four, two, eight, Each eye is assigned seven, three, a separate eight. score. So that's 20 over 20 vision on both eyes, which is normal. Next, we will assess the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves, which control eye movement via the extraocular muscles. These tests consist of smooth pursuit, reflexive and volitional saccades, and the oculocephalic maneuver. So I'm going to look at your extraocular movements now. First, I'm going to check your smooth pursuit. So I'd like you just to follow my finger with your eyes without moving your head. The H shape allows you to assess all three cranial nerves by isolating each of the extraocular muscles. Good. So you have nice smooth pursuits. The amplitude of the movements is full in all directions, and I don't see any abnormal movements like nystagmus, so that's normal. I'm going to look now at your uh, reflexive saccades. So just look at the hand that's waving and my nose. And saccades are high velocity nose. eye movements used and for hand. visual search. And my nose. Reflexive saccades can be tested by holding up your hands about three feet apart and, and wiggling your fingers. Excellent. We'll also look at your volitional saccades. So I'd like you to look all the way to the left and back to me and all the way to the right and back to me, and all the way up, and back to me, and look all the way down, and back to me. Great. So full amplitude of movements, nice quick movements that are initiated without any difficulty, all normal. Great. So keep looking right at my face. The oculocephalic maneuver tests the cranial nerves and nuclei serving the extraocular muscles. A normal patient will maintain a forward gaze as their head is turned. It is particularly useful in comatose patients who cannot voluntarily move their eyes. The trigeminal nerve carries both sensory and motor information. The sensory fibers can be assessed using light touch, pinprick, and the corneal reflex. The motor fibers can be assessed by examining the muscles of mastication. I'm going to check the sensation on your face now, okay? So this should feel like a, a light touch, is that right? And does that feel like a light touch there? Yes. Be sure to examine the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular branches of the trigeminal nerve. And here. And it's the same on both sides. Yes. Yeah. And here. And here. Yes. And here. And here. Yes. Good. Felt the same on both sides. That's right. Great. And we'll just check with pinprick sensation now. That feels sharp. Yes. And that feels sharp there. Yes. And if you detect an area of abnormal sensation, carefully map out the affected area by working out from the point of least sensation. So that looks like normal sensation, at least in the three branches of the trigeminal nerve on both sides. The muscles of mastication controlled by the trigeminal nerve include the masseter, temporalis, and pterygoid. Examine the bulk of the masseter and temporalis muscles. 
Hollowing of these areas is a sign of muscle atrophy, which may indicate damage to the trigeminal nerve. So I'm going to look at the strength in your chewing muscles now, okay? So I'd like you just to clench your teeth together and relax, good, and clench your teeth together. You should feel your fingers rise slightly due to muscle contraction when the patient clenches their jaw. And relax, excellent. And open your mouth and don't let me close it. Great, okay. So nice, good contraction of all the muscles of mastication there. I think that's normal. So I'm gonna check a reflex here called the corneal reflex. It's going to involve me just lightly touching your eye with this tissue here, is that okay? So I want you just to keep your head straight but look all the way to the side. Approach the eye from the side and out of the patient's line of vision so that the reflex is not elicited by visual stimulation. A normal corneal reflex involves involuntary blinking when the cornea is touched. The facial nerve innervates the muscles of facial expression and is tested by inspection of the face and evaluation of specific expressions. This nerve is also involved in the sensation of taste, lacrimation, salivation, and the stapedius reflex. First inspect the patient's face for signs of muscle weakness and asymmetry, such as droopy eyelids or lips. Next, test the muscles of facial expression through specific maneuvers. So can you um, just scrunch your forehead up and down for me like this? Excellent, great. And close your eyes very tight, tight as you can. Don't let me open them. Don't let me open them. Good. And relax. Excellent. And can you show me your teeth like this? Great. Nice big smile. Excellent. And puff your cheeks out full of air. Very good. Okay. That's great. Looks like it's all symmetric and, and nice normal facial strength there. As the name implies, the vestibulocochlear nerve innervates the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus. These structures are involved in hearing and spatial orientation respectively. Normally, a brief hearing test is sufficient for screening this nerve, but further testing can be performed if indicated. I'm just going to screen for some hearing loss here. I'd like you to close your eyes. And do you hear a soft sound in one ear? Yes. Which one? Left. How about now? Right. Good. Okay. If hearing loss is detected, differentiate between conductive and sensory neural hearing loss using the Weber and Rene tests. Conductive hearing loss refers to problems with the outer or middle ear. Sensory neural hearing loss refers to problems with the inner ear or vestibulocochlear nerve. I'm going to place this tuning fork on your forehead and you're going to hear a high-pitched buzzing. Please tell me if you hear it more in one ear or the other or if it's the same on both sides. It's the same in both. Great, so that's normal, it doesn't lateralize. Sound will lateralize to the damaged ear in the case of conductive hearing loss or the undamaged ear in the case of sensory neural hearing loss. Remember that some people with normal hearing will also experience lateralization, so only use this test in the context of hearing loss. So I'm gonna put this tuning fork behind your ear. You should hear it ringing. Tell me when you no longer hear it ringing. Place the vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid okay. process. Mm -hmm. This bypasses the middle ear and allows you to isolate the patient's sensory neural hearing. Okay. Do you hear it again? Yes. Okay, good. Once the patient cannot hear the vibrations through their mastoid process, place the tuning fork beside their ear to include the conductive hearing mechanism. Normally, the patient should still be able to hear the tuning fork when it is placed beside the ear since the ear detects vibrations through the air better than through the bone. In conductive hearing loss, the patient will be unable to hear the tuning fork when it is placed beside the ear. In sensory neural hearing loss, the patient should be able to hear the tuning fork when it is placed beside the ear. So on both sides, the air conduction was greater than the bone conduction, which is normal. Okay, so now what I want you to do is keep focusing right uh, here on the bridge of my nose. I'm going to turn your head fairly rapidly, so just keep your head nice and loose. Okay, so just keep it nice and relaxed. Good. Normally, the patient's eyes will remain fixated looking at the examiner. If there is dysfunction of the vestibular system, when the head is turned towards the dysfunctional side, a corrective saccade, or fast jumping eye movement will be observed. 
To prevent injury, refrain from performing this maneuver in patients with neck problems. Okay. So can you look to your left and look all the way back? And I'm going to bring you back quite quickly and your head is going to be hanging off the side of the bed. Come back. Quickly lower the patient into a supine position with their neck extended and turned and to the side. A positive finding entails the patient reporting vertigo as well as observable horizontal nystagmus. This test is used to detect benign paroxysmal positional vertigo due to an inner ear disorder. And you didn't feel dizzy with either of those? No. No, and I didn't see any nystagmus either. The glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves innervate the soft palate and the uvula. To assess these nerves, inspect the back of the mouth, perform the gag reflex, and evaluate the patient's phonation. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at the back of your throat here. First, inspect for symmetry of the soft palate on either side of the uvula. Uh, and now can you say ah? Uh, now, inspect for symmetrical uh, elevation of the soft palate and the uvula. If the patient has suspected brainstem pathology, impaired consciousness, or impaired swallowing, proceed to testing the gag reflex. I'm just going to touch the back of your throat. This will be just slightly uncomfortable. Touch the posterior pharynx and observe elevation of the tongue and soft palate and constriction of the pharyngeal muscles. That's a normal gag reflex on both sides. So what brings you to the doctor's office today? When doing history taking, listen carefully to the patient's voice. Cranial nerve 10 is responsible for phonation, and cranial nerves 7, 9, 10, and 12 all have roles in articulation so abnormalities in speech can provide important clues about cranial nerve pathology. Among other things, the accessory nerve innervates the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. You can test for the accessory nerve by assessing the strength of these muscles. I'm going to have a look at your neck muscle strength now. Can you turn your head to this side? and push against my hand and resist that. This tests the left sternocleidomastoid muscle. Can you turn to the other side and again push against my hand and resist it? And again, I can see and feel a nice contraction of the muscle. Um, can you shrug your shoulders all the way up to your ears and down? Okay, again, and don't let me push down, resist against me. Good, excellent, so that's normal strength. Finally, we will be assessing the hypoglossal nerve which innervates the tongue. Inspect the tongue at rest and assess its strength. So last we're going to just look at your tongue strength. At first I'd just like to see it. Can you open your mouth for me? Observe the tongue muscle. Check for normal bulk and if there are any fasciculations. There may be some contractions due to tone in the mouth. These are minimized by inspecting the tongue at rest. Stick your tongue straight out for me. Great, and move it from side to side. Excellent, can you bury your tongue in your cheek? and push against me, and on the other side. Excellent, good. Normal tongue strength there. So that concludes our cranial nerve exam. Thank you so much. Thank you.